Welcome to Tuesday's edition of COVID-19. Coronavirus variants continue to threaten containment efforts, which in turn are hindering economic recovery. Now, we have more on this lined up later on the program, but first I have Kwon Soa standing by with the pandemic updates. Now, Soa, Korea is noting a third day of cases in the 300s, I hear. Yes, Sonny, that's right. But this Tuesday's caseload is slightly higher compared to Monday. 336 infections were confirmed as of 12 a.m. However, there hasn't been a dramatic change in domestic transmission transmissions, which have been remaining in the high 200s for the second straight day, while we are seeing imported cases more than doubled from yesterday. Now, what also has doubled is the daily death toll as we have 10 new fatalities this Tuesday. We have uh, 140 people, fewer people in quarantine and 466 new recoveries, while the total stands at 78,844. And if we now turn over to our ground uh, we see, as Sunny earlier mentioned, for the third straight day, cases have been in the 300s. So we are down from the 400s and even 500s that we saw recently. So with that, the daily average of domestic transmissions in the past week has now dropped to below 400. And uh, yes, Sunny. Right. So do tell us more about the latest outbreaks, though. All right. Uh, following last week's massive cluster infections related to a missionary training center, now we are having new outbreaks at a homeless shelter, confined run room living spaces, as well as hospitals and other day-to-day uh, -day venues. So along with that, also imported cases of the COVID-19 variant are continuously emerging, too. So that is why the strong social distancing measures are still in effect. And speaking of which, uh, According to a survey by the health ministry, 81% of 1,000 adults believe that social distancing measures were effective in getting the third wave of the virus here in the country under control. But also 81% said that they feel fatigue from those measures. Meanwhile, 97% say that they have been cooperating in the social distancing campaign, for instance, by canceling gatherings. And that cooperation is still needed as we are still seeing seeing uh, infections scattered across the country. And uh, this Tuesday, we see a triple digit figure here in the capital, Seoul, 128 infections, followed by 82 in Gyeonggi-do province, and also double digits in some uh, southern parts and central parts of the country. We also have, out of the 41 imported cases, 12 were detected at the nation's airports or seaports. So with that, let's take a look at the global figures now. We have the U.S. at almost 27 million infections and our Tongmin is going to take a closer look at the situation in the U.S. and then South Africa that's dealing with a variant here at 1.45 million. Uh, we will connect to someone, a doctor via Skype later to talk about South Africa as well. And uh, with that, the global total number of cases now stands at uh, around 103.9 million, as we can see here. Let's take a closer look at the daily increases that we just saw here. Here, the U.S., 144,000 new cases. So we are seeing a rise from the days before and 25,000 infections in Brazil. Also, 18,000 new cases reported in the U.K. And those are the updates I have for now, but I'll be back in a bit after the government briefing. Sunny? All right, Soa, thank you. Now, as Soa just mentioned, up next, we take a look at efforts to contain COVID-19 under the Biden administration as vaccine rollouts have yet to ease the severity of the situation in the U.S. with regard to the unfortunate losses of lives. I have Yoon Jung Min here in the studio. Welcome, Jung Min. Hello, Sunny. So let's start with the latest on the vaccination campaign over in the U.S. Right, Sunny. So as of February 1st, um, over 32 million doses have been administered, while almost uh, 50 million doses have been uh, distributed to public health providers. But it appears it's still not enough, with the U.S. still reporting tens of thousands of new infections a day and a total of over uh, 26 million cases. Take a listen. I want to level with the public that we are facing two constraining factors. The first is getting enough supply quickly enough. And the second is the ability to administer the vaccines quickly once they're produced and sent out to the sites. The senior advisors at the U.S. government is taking action to increase vaccine supply and capacity. But he added that even so, it could take months before everyone who wants a vaccine will be able to get one. 
In the meantime, the Biden team is reportedly trying to locate millions of vaccines that were sent to states during the Trump administration. Politico reported Saturday that the team has found some 20 million doses that the federal government bought and distributed to states but did not have tracking information. Biden officials that the missing doses are spread, spread out across the states with the lack of data forcing them to track down the vaccines. I see. Meanwhile, Changmin, before we proceed any further, what appears to be the status quo with regard to the pandemic over in the U.S.? Right, Sonny. So, well, for the first time in about two months, um, fewer than 100,000 Americans are hospitalized for coronavirus. Well, CNN says the U.S. reported some uh, 95,000 COVID-19 hospitalizations on Saturday, Sunday that is, and uh, 97,000 on Saturday. The last time the number fell below the 100,000 mark was on December 1st. Yet the weekly average of new cases is still about the same as early December, and the average number of daily deaths is more than double what it was then. Experts are urging Americans to wear their masks and socially distance, particularly during the winter. Right, Changmin. And what is the Biden administration's strategy in tackling the pandemic? Well, um, first, Biden set a goal of uh, 100 million vaccinations within his uh, first 100 days in office. And um, since Biden took over the White House, um, the U.S. has administered 1 million vaccines a day. And also, the new administration is looking into prop up the economy, uh, which has been hit hard by the pandemic. President Biden has urged the Senate for a 1.9 trillion U.S. dollar COVID-19 relief plan. Biden plans to offer $1,400 direct payments to households and use the money to expand vaccinations and reopen schools. Also, he plans to gradually increase the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. Take a look. The, we have to act now. It's, it's, there's no time for any delay. And so we can end up with four million fewer jobs this year, according to Moody's, a Wall Street firm, and it could take a year longer to return to full employment if we don't act and don't act now. Also, Biden has rolled out a mandate on mask wearing and physical distancing in all federal buildings. It was one of the first executive orders he signed at the White House after taking office a few weeks ago. Starting from Monday, people are now required by law to wear masks on public transportation following a CDC order last week. Travelers have to wear masks on airplanes, subways, buses, and every other form of public transportation. They are only allowed to take them off for a brief periods, such as when they need to drink or take medication. I understand the new administration is also seeking a multilateral approach against COVID-19. You're absolutely right, Sonny. So, um, the U.S. is returning to multilateralism in fight against COVID-19, and of course that means um, that includes more bilateral, active bilateral cooperation with South Korea as well. And last week, uh, Seoul's Foreign Minister Kang Kyung-hwa and her U.S. New American counterpart, Antony Blinken, held phone talks about for about 30 minutes. Among the many issues they discussed was working together on the pandemic front, and they also took the opportunity to reaffirm the South Korea-U.S. alliance and close cooperation on many fronts. And it was no surprise to see Biden declaring his intention to, intention to rejoin the World Health Organization soon after he took office in January. Now, when it comes to U.S.-China relations, although the U.S. may continue to lock horns with China under the Biden administration over many issues, including trade and human rights, there could be still room for cooperation on many other fronts like uh, public health. I see. All right, Changmin, as always, thank you very much for that coverage. My pleasure. Right, it's time now for the regular briefing on COVID-19 here in Korea for this Tuesday. Yes, as of February 2nd midnight, we have a total of 295 new local infections and 41 new imported cases. The total caseload now stands at 78,844. Currently, we have 8,634 remaining in quarantine, and there are 224 patients with severe or critical conditions. This is a drop by one from the day before. And as of yesterday, we had 10 additional fatalities. I extend my deepest condolences to the deceased and the members of the bereaved families. And here are some updates on our new domestic cases. 
Uh, nationwide, we see 295 new local infections and by region, 199 reported in the metropolitan area, while 96 were reported in the non-metropolitan area. In Chungcheong, we have 33, Honam 27, in Gyeongbuk 20 cases, and Gyeongnam uh, 19, and Gangwon 7 cases, and we had zero cases reported in the Jeju Island. And recently, we starting uh, stemming from the non-accredited educational facilities uh, run by the IM Mission Group. We are seeing an upward. We have seen an upward trend. However, we are seeing a slight downward trend, uh, which is not a clear sign of a, down, a clear um, plunge in the number of cases. Uh, yet. And as for Seoul City uh, in Songdonggu district in relation to the university hospital, we identified five additional cases in total. We have identified 52 uh, cases to date. And in Seoul's Gangdonggu district in relation to an oriental hospital, uh, we identified the first index case uh, last month and we identified 19 additional cases and a total of 20 people have been confirmed. To date. And in Seoul, Jungu District, in relation to unwelfare facility, we also identified nine additional cases, and in total, we have 63 cases being confirmed to date. And in Gyeonggi, the province, Kimpo City, in relation to a daycare center, we also identified 10 additional cases, and a total of 38 people have been confirmed to date. And in Chungbuk, Chungbuk uh, Chungju City and Jeonbuk, Kimje City, we have the meat processing company and we have identified two additional cases and a total of 56 people have been confirmed to date. In Gwangju City, in relation to an adult game room number one in Gugu District, uh, after the 31st of January, we identified nine additional cases. In total, uh, there are 27 cases being confirmed to date. Moreover, in Gwangju's Buku district, in relation to the second adult game room, we also identified five additional cases and a total of 23 people have been confirmed to date. And as of now, we are seeing cluster infections stemming from many uh, multiple venues as, like hospitals as well as uh, other uh, manufacturing assembly lines. And today, we would like to go through uh, some COVID-19 risk factors for juveniles, especially under the age of 18. Here are some updates. First of all, according to the WHO's reports, those under the age of 10, uh, compared to uh, the senior age uh, people, uh, they have also less uh, infectious um, infections, and we have also seen a less uh, rate of infection. And also here in South Korea, studying about 75,000 cases of the COVID-19 patients, we have confirmed uh, that some 6,000 cases were below the age of 18, and they account for about 8.9% of uh, the uh, total cases. And as for 100, every 100,000 uh, patients, uh, people, we also have a different uh, proportion of the uh, patients, and we have about 103 patients uh, uh, in the age group of 16 to 18, and we have seen about 45 patients for per every 100,000 uh, population, which is quite a uh, lower uh, proportion, and we also see uh, that this is the trend that we are monitoring right now, and especially those under the age of six, especially uh, also uh, those between the age group of seven and 12, compared to other age groups, we have only seen half of the confirmed cases. And looking at the sources of infection for these juvenile cases under the age of 18, here are some details. And most of the cases were stemming from a family-related uh, cluster infections, especially uh, getting infected by their parents, and they also override the number of the 
school infections. And we also have seen uh, that with the lower age group, we are seeing more family transmissions as well. And also there were some uh, discrepancy among uh, those people who are under the age of uh, 12 and also between 13 and 18. Especially young children under the age of eight, uh, 12 had more infections stemming from family-related uh, infections. However, during uh, for the age group of uh, 13 to 18, uh, they had more cluster infections and they also had relatively lower uh, cases of family stemming uh, infections. Moreover, schools as well as other academic institutions uh, stemming uh, ben, uh, the cluster infections, we have seen about 5% uh, for children under the age of 7 and also 10% uh, for the, those uh, aged 13, uh, between 13 and 18. Uh, so it means uh, that a younger age group saw less uh, infections stemming from uh, these schools as well as other uh, educational facilities. And this is not a trend that we witness uh, not only here in Korea, but is, it is also a common trend that is witnessed uh, at other countries as well. According to announcements made by the WHO, among the global population, uh, the ratio of the children and uh, teenagers stand about 29 percent. However, we only have about 8 percent of the COVID-19 patients among uh, these age group. Moreover, once they are, uh, even they are uh, contracted with the virus, uh, they have light symptoms or no symptoms, and also they they have a very low uh, infectious rate compared to other uh, age groups. And we, through uh, the course of carrying out such analysis, we have found uh, many findings, and we still highlight the importance of uh, antivirus measures at schools. Moreover, we ask the parents to wear their face masks even uh, at uh, office spaces so that they can they do not spread the virus to their family members and also refrain from having private gatherings of five or more people and also wash their hands on a uh, regular basis after returning home. However, on the other hand, if, a children, uh, if children with underlying uh, illnesses uh, contract the virus, uh, they have higher uh, ratio of developing into critical conditions, so we ask ask for uh, particular precautions if there uh, are children with uh, such underlying illnesses. Moreover, in order to ensure safe uh, and healthy school life, uh, students need to wear face masks at all times and wash their hands and uh, person, uh, personal hygiene as well. And if they feel sick, they should not go to school, but rather get tested as soon as possible. And at schools, it is very important to reduce uh, the overcrowdedness as well as uh, carrying out uh, ventilation on a regular basis. Moreover, uh, the safety e-report run by the safety ministry, here are some updates on our latest re uh, reports. Currently, we are seeing uh, many cluster infections stemming from uh, the uh, nor nursing hospitals as well as nursing uh, homes, and we also see number a uh, number of breaches at these uh, number uh, these new uh, uh, these venues as well as postpartum uh, care centers and other uh, public uh, uh, public spaces. And there were some people who did not wear face masks when they visited uh, these places, and also some uh, healthcare professionals uh, they did not wear their face mask properly as well. It is very important to note that these healthcare related service uh, um, these uh, public venues are very important to uh, protect the lives and the well-being of their uh, users at as well as their uh, parents, a patient. So it is very important that we follow uh, the visitor log as well as complete uh, guidance to the hygiene measures. Currently, the COVID-19 uh, battle is also being uh, prolonged. And against this backdrop, there are many citizens feeling a high level of fatigue. And we only have one week left until the Lunar New Year holiday, uh, during which many people longed for uh, meeting their family members. And we understand uh, that they are uh, very much willing to meet with their family members uh, person to person. However, uh, still we are seeing a silent spreaders within our community, so it is not time yet for us to stay complacent. During the Lunar New Year holiday, it is very important that we do not travel and we uh, also keep a social distance and healthy distance. Uh, it is uh, very difficult. However, we ask for your understanding and participation. Moreover, we al also see higher risks of 
infection stemming from uh, the homeless shelters. Uh, at these homeless shelters, uh, the people who are staying there, uh, the homeless people, they are prone to uh, virus infections and they also need to take particular precautions. However, they do not have a, an official uh, residential area and nor a, contract, a contact number. It is very difficult for the quarantine authorities to get uh, in contact with them. Uh, therefore, it is very important for the quarantine authorities to carry out continued monitoring. And it is very important to also carry out massive testings for uh, these uh, homeless uh, people. And we will also exert our full efforts to this end. We have started February and we hope, uh, believe, uh, we hope that this new month could also initiate a return to our state of normalcy. And with the rollout of the vaccines, the quarantine authorities will continue to stay vigilant, and we will also exert our full efforts to carry out our epidemiological control measures. Last but not least, we have many medical professionals who are fighting at the forefront, as well as micro business owners and self employed who are also helping us out. And also, as the citizens, we would like to thank them once again and thank you very much. Right, so there was Lee Sang Won, which used his afternoon briefing. He spent quite some time talking about the impact of COVID-19 on children and teenagers. Right, uh, he uh, cited a WHO report that said uh, children under the age of 10, first off, had an infection rate comparably lower than people aged above 10. And then here in Korea, there has been a domestic study uh, on 75,000 people aged below 18 and 6,700 18 uh, patients so far were patients uh, aged below 18. So that's 8.9% of the total number of cases here in Korea. So that is uh, uh, lower than the older age groups. And he said that the younger, the lower the infection rate seemed to be because there were only 65 cases that were uh, below aged six and below. Uh, but he did mention that if those children and adolescents did get infected, it mainly happened within the family and not at education facilities such as schools, which is why he called on parents uh, to also wear their masks when they're at work so that they do not transmit uh, these, um, uh, the COVID-19 virus to their children, even though there is a lower rate of infection among these younger people. I see. All right, so I'll thank you for that. I'll see you again tomorrow. See you tomorrow. We turn now to South Africa, where the first shipments of COVID-19 vaccines have arrived and are being hailed as a chance to turn the tide on the pandemic. Now, all this amid cautious news of reinfection with the South African variant. For more, I have Dr. Richard Lessels from the University of KwaZulu, Natal, live on the line. Welcome, Dr. Lessels. Good afternoon. Now, Doctor, I understand the coronavirus variant first detected in South Africa poses an alarming risk of reinfection. Please tell us more about this grim reality and have such cases of reinfection been recorded in South Africa? Well, certainly we've we've been detecting cases of reinfection recently in, in the kind of second wave that, that we've had over the past few weeks. But at the moment, we're just analyzing the, the testing data, the laboratory data to really get a good handle on how many reinfections have been happening and how much that's been contributing to the to the epidemic over the past few weeks. Dr. Lessers, have there been any notable symptoms within patients who have been reinfected with the variant? Well, again, that's that's a critical question that we're that we're looking at at the moment, because one of the theories is that um, even if people do get reinfected, they're unlikely to get severe disease they're, 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 They may get a milder illness, but that's something that we're trying to confirm at the moment by going into the clinical details of the cases that have been detected. I see, which means prospects of a full recovery among patients who have been reinfected are quite high then? Well, that, that's the theory. But as I say, what we're doing now is to actually look at the clinical details and confirm whether that's the case. But that's certainly what the, what the kind of thinking would be. I see. Dr. Lessers, how authorities are responding to the reality that the South African variant may be resistant to current vaccines? 
Well, I think it's important to note there that um, we don't believe that the, the variant is resistant to the vaccines. What we saw last week was some results of trials uh, conducted here in South Africa of some of the different vaccines. And that showed that they still had good efficacy and particularly good efficacy against severe disease and hospitalization. So it seems that even in the face of this, of this variant, the vaccines will still offer very good protection against severe disease. And that's, that's the critically important thing for countries like South Africa, is to really start bringing down the number of severe cases, hospitalizations and, and, and deaths. But you're right, what these trials also showed was some drop off in efficacy when you compared the results in South Africa to the results of the same or similar trials in other countries. Now, we need to see more details of that, and it's, it's often difficult to make these comparisons, but it does suggest that the, the variant and the mutations in this particular variant are giving some capacity of the virus to evade the immunity not just the natural immunity, but also the vaccine-induced immunity. I see. And against that backdrop, Dr. Lessos, the government there has decided to ease some COVID-19 restrictions. As a medical expert yourself, how do you respond to these measures? That's right. So last night, the president announced uh, some easing of the restrictions, and, and that's in response to kind of uh, falling case numbers and falling hospitalizations and, and various other indicators kind of going in the right direction. And, and clearly that's a positive thing for now. But I think that myself and others are, are very cautious that this time as we come out of this second wave, we really need to try and drive the transmission levels down as low as we can um, to avoid this virus kind of resurging, but also to avoid it evolving further and evolving further mutations that might affect, again, the vaccines or might make the virus more transmissible and things. So what we would like is that we've kind of learned the lessons from coming out of the first wave. And, and now that we kind of redouble our efforts to really get the transmission down to, to as low a level as we can. Right. Doctor, one final question before you go. Pundits are hoping that herd immunity through public inoculations will bring an end to the pandemic. What are the prerequisites for such a scenario? Yeah, I mean, I personally think that the, the talk of herd immunity at the moment is, is, is is, is not the wisest move, because I think there's just still too many unknowns with this virus, and, and particularly with the emergence of these variants and, and the effect on the vaccines. I, and I, I think what we have to just focus on is, is getting the vaccines into as many people as quickly as possible. Uh, initially, as I say, certainly in countries like ours, the priority is to reduce the, the burden of severe illness and, and, and the deaths and to protect our healthcare workers. I think beyond that, we can clearly then start thinking about how it impacts on transmission more generally. And then that obviously then starts thinking about herd immunity. But I think at the moment, it's, it's really too early to be thinking about that uh, as, as, the, as the goal of our current strategy. Right. All right, Dr. Lessels, thank you very much for making the time to join us live at this hour with your insights. Thank you. Right. Imagine a surgical emergency that involves a patient who may or may not be infected with COVID-19. While it is standard procedure to test those seeking surgery for COVID-19 before letting them into emergency rooms, what are the protocols in the case of emergencies that allow no time for such testing? We answer that question in this report. Negative pressure patient rooms have become high in demand amid the pandemic. Used in hospitals to prevent cross-contamination and keep patients isolated, these rooms prevent the air inside from escaping by keeping their air pressure lower than the external environment. The same technique has also been applied to create negative pressure surgery rooms. 
we visited a designated COVID-19 treatment hospital north of Seoul to find out more. Inside the surgery room, this negative pressure machine is where all the magic happens. Corona 환자를 수술한다 하면 코로나 환자는 호흡이나 혹은 출혈이나 어떤 몸에서 나온 체액이나 이런 것들에 떠 있는 바이러스가 바깥으로 흘러나가게 되면 양압이기 때문에 주변에 있는 수술실이나 이런 데가 다 오염이 될수 있습니다. 그래서 코로나 환자나 이런 감염병 환자를 수술을 하려면 수술실에 음압 시설을 해야 되는 거죠. Once the machine is turned on, the doors are closed, and the air pressure inside the surgery room quickly drops to below normal levels. This very room also carried out an emergency operation on a COVID-19 patient who had developed acute appendicitis. The patient was saved, and the hospital's post-surgery report was published on an international medical journal. Negative pressure rooms have become essential, as highlighted by this case, and they've also been used to treat foreign patients who've tested positive for COVID-19 upon arriving in Korea. COVID-19 testing is a requirement for all patients before they can be admitted to a hospital. But it does not apply to ER patients in critical condition, and the medical staff must work under the assumption that he or she could be a COVID-19 carrier. Despite the growing need for negative pressure surgery rooms, supply is struggling to meet demand. But hospitals across the country are installing as many as they can as quickly as possible amid the COVID-19 outbreak. The transition will be difficult and costly, but they are necessary to deliver the highest quality of medical care to the country's growing number of COVID-19 patients. Korea marked an end to 2020 with its gross domestic product shrinking 1% compared to the year prior. Now, while it is the steepest fall since 1998, it's also the smallest contraction among OECD member states. For more, I have Professor Song, Song Soo Young from Chungang University. Welcome back, Professor Song. Thank you for inviting me. And I also have Professor Yang Hee Dong from Iwa Women's University. Pleasure to have you back, Professor Young. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Professor Song, what mm. are your thoughts on Korea's economic performance last year? Yeah, actually, we have recorded a negative 1% uh, 
in terms of annual growth rate. At least uh, it means that our welfare and uh, living standard has been uh, dwindled. But however, in comparison to other advanced countries, including uh, members of the OECD countries, then our performance is much better than other countries. So to that regard, I can say that in the future, our prospect of the recovery of the economy is much more promising and uh, much, much more likely to take a very quick V-shaped uh, economic return to the normal situation. So that's uh, what, uh, what, I, what I can make a forecast about the future and then on the ground that we have our relative performance is much better than other countries. Right. Professor Yang, compared to its counterparts in the OECD, Korea's economy has fared tangibly better. What are the implications of this reality? Well, the last year, the uh, world economy record has, you know, has negative growth, about 4%, whereas our country has recorded pretty, relatively pretty handsome, uh, the, the growth rate, which is minus 1%. The major driver for this, uh, you know, uh, the handsome or handsome uh, growth is due to the very proactive, the export record. Uh, the, in December, our export has grown about more than 12.5%, uh, and uh, January, we had a very handsome uh, growth again. I think the major impact of this hands record is we, we came to a recover some confidence in our future and our economic activities. I think that is most the positive aspect and impact from this record. Right. Professor Sung, keeping in mind what Professor Yang has just mm. said, how do you explain the expansion in exports despite the tough times? Yeah, um, I would like to raise the three factors of concern. One is the coronavirus pandemic. The second one is the zero carbon emission policy that was pursued by all the advanced countries. And the third one is a digitalization. So the final two, the, uh, the final two component factors uh, drive the, some external demand for the, particularly the semiconductor because the zero, uh, zero carbon emission implies that we have to develop, rely on the, some uh, not fossil fuel, on the, some electricity cars so they need so many semiconductors. So that is the main driving force. In addition to that, the manufacturing and the equipment, particularly for the demand for the car, is surging in advanced countries. But the problem, the other, well, most other countries, as the number shows, that they have negative, show the negative numbers of gross rate. It means the economy is, uh, activity is uh, decreasing, decreased. So that's why relatively demand for our exports is increased a lot. So despite the domestic demand is weakening, then still the relatively the supply of the products is uh, cut short. That's why we have a relatively strong demand for our exports. Right. Professor Yang, the IMF meanwhile has projected a 3.1% growth for Korea's economy this year. What factors do you believe has served to uh, back this optimistic outlook by the IMF? I think there are a couple of major the, uh, reasons, the factors that have driven such a very positive aspect and forecast for the Korean economy this year. The first reason is Korean government has a very, very, very effective in dealing with the, the uh, COVID-19. For example, last year, the Korean government supported the emergency aid in September and November and also the January this year. And uh, immediately after that support, I mean, current, particularly domestic, local, uh, the service and demand has been increased, very, very handsome. So, and second one is, uh, we're going to have a uh, very effective uh, vaccination and services this year. So, but for both, uh, those two are the major reasons why many people, I mean, even the uh, in the foreign countries have developed a very positive forecast for the Korean economy this year. Professor, so, despite the overall positive economic performance, the real economy as experienced by the public, including the self-employed, has not been as favorable. How do you explain this discrepancy? Yeah, actually, the, because of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, has, uh, our economy is decreasing by negative 1%. So that is true to all other, almost all other countries, except China and the, some small country. So to that regard, despite that, still uh, what matters, what is of concern is because the particular capital market, the price of the stocks has been soared, particularly in the United States and in Korea also, we have witnessed the unprecedented historical high 
uh, score or high index uh, point of the S&P 500 and the Kospi index. So the reason is because of low interest rate and another driving factor is despite the low rate of return, the inflation rate is very low. Particularly even in Korea, uh, GDP deflator is negative in the ra range. So to that regard, the real interest, the real rate of yield or real rate of return is relatively pretty high because two percentage of low rate subtracted by the negative inflation rate, expected inflation rate or long-term inflation rate, that turns out to be very uh, lucrative or it looks very profitable for the capital market. That's why uh, we have witnessed to in the United States and in Korea and other countries, we have seen the capital market surge in the, despite the some real economy has suffered so much from the, some uh, decreasing demand. Right. So that's why. Professor Yang, staying with the real economy, what are your proposals with regard to easing the financial hardships for the self-employed given the current social restrictions? Well, the, uh, we have a uh, very high self-employment rate you know, within the, you know, in, in the global uh, world. Uh, for example, at, at the moment, our self-employment rate amounts, almost amounts to 27 or 28 percent, whereas U.S. has very low, like you know, uh, 6.3 or the, uh, 7 percent, and Japan may have about 11 percent. Well, the similar self-employment rates in the global economy is about Italy or the Spain. So Italy has about 25 percent and Spain may have about 18 percent. That's why mm. if our country is locked down, we may suffer a lot, right? Uh, so uh, that's why the Spain and Italy have suffered a lot compared to other European countries due to the COVID-19. So all this fact, the rest all implies the Korean government should provide very selective you know, immigrant aid, uh, particularly to the uh, self-employment, uh, the, the peoples. So I know the Korean government has supported a lot uh, through their uh, fiscal services or financial support, but they should be more and more selective and more intelligent in supporting the right people in the Korean economy. Mm. Professor, so mm. the Bank of Korea, meanwhile, claims the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact mm -hmm. on temporary workers, the uh, low-income families, as well as the less educated, and they've called for better support for these vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I look into the report and I found out that the poverty index they have shown is uh, 60 percentage of a median income level is uh, increased. I mean, the number of the people who has, uh, whose income is just 60 percent of median income is increased. So that implies that our the poverty uh, index is worsening. I mean, and on the other hand, uh, there are some other people who has, as uh, Professor Young mentioned, their employment, unemployment rate is soared clearly, and uh, some employed per pe people also is uh, declining. Then the issue is, because even IMF, uh, uh, the staff, the, Mr. Bauer has uh, advised to make uh, some targeted support for the people who are suffered from the, who suffered from the economic loss. But the target does not mean that divide the people according to the quantile or according to the level of the income, divide people into and select and then provide some people who, whose income is lower percentage. That is not a good way because target means uh, that should be like if people are unemployed, if the self-employed shop owner decided to shut down his own restaurant or cafe, then those people are clearly shown that they, are, they have suffered from the COVID-19 pandemic spread. So target means those people should be supported, but we should not just divide according to the, some lower 50 percentage income people or wealth. That only, provide, uh, that only promotes uh, some conflict among the people who are, who are very close to the quantile line, I mean the borderline between the, the low 25 percent, then some people who are in the 26 percent, then they, they, are, they do, cannot get the support, but whereas 24 percent, they can get the support. That it does not make sense. So target implies that should be, should imply that in the contingency, what happened? Why? And the, the people are unemployed, become unemployed still, even though they are looking for the job. So that is very delicate and the government should take efforts and they must 
execute their capacity to uh, to support those people. Right. Uh, Professor Yang, the IMF has also urged for continued fiscal support for a tangible economic recovery. How does Korea's fiscal standing or health compare to that of its counterparts across the world? Well, the uh, Korean government has asserted a lot that they have provided enough support for, again, the self-employment or low-income people. But compared to other countries, our the support ratio is relatively low because in our support, particularly the fiscal support pertaining to uh, the COVID-19 has reached about 3.4% you know, out of our the overall GDP. Whereas a lot of uh, the advanced countries have supported about 8% or even 10% uh, of their uh, the, uh, overall GDP. And if you expand the support to the financial support using the, uh, the banking systems, uh, our Korean economy has supported about 10% using the financial support, whereas this ratio is also very uh, ranked very low compared to other countries. So if you combine both the fiscal and financial support uh, you know, initiated by the Korean government, I think uh, we should increase all the support because still uh, there are a lot of uh, victims from the COVID-19 and that's why the Congressman Shim Sang-jung has submitted a very special you know, uh, the petition to uh, develop the new regulations so that the Korean government has, uh, could increase their uh, particular special support uh, for the, to deal with the COVID-19. Right. Very briefly speaking, Professor, so what mm. is the economic strategy that Korea should adopt for sustainable growth in the future? Yeah, I strongly recommend the Korean government to continue current uh, policy, particularly the Green New Deal and the uh, active fiscal policy and the accommodative financial uh, monetary policy, and then uh, emphasize, emphasis on the, some public health protection. That three prongs are most important way we should, uh, the government should take, and then the future will be very promising. Right. All right, Professor Song, as always, mm. thank you very much for your insights. And mm. Professor Yang, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Right. A tangible economic rebound is possible if the pandemic is brought under control. Having said that, we ask our viewers here to seek to abide by current efforts to contain COVID-19. Thank you for watching.